Hey, how are you, Fran? I'm good, neighbour. How are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. I've got a guest. Oh, is it Will? Oh my God! Got Will. <laughs> he's he's driving me crazy today. Will. Look at how big he's got. Oh my God, Owen. I mean, so just tell everybody, right? You you <laughs> very sadly lost your dog of years and years, which was yeah. heartbreaking a while ago. Yeah. I know for you and Mark, it was. It's like you know. Pets are such a huge part of the family, yeah. and I'm sure on your part it took a lot of sort of courage to go. Can we can we get a new puppy? But you yeah. you've dived in and you've we got did it. baby Will. Yeah. He's great. He's great. Well, you bumped into him last week when I saw you. And I did. He was tiny, but like in a week he's like become. I say I've got to lift him up. Like a monster dog. Will. I know. <laughs> oh, I okay. Okay. Him. He's really, really cute. I'm going to put him down before he starts barking. Oh, well, well, we're happy for Will to be part of this chat. Anyway, he may that's going to help he us get rid of Sunday night dreads. He may come back at some point, honestly. He, from about six o'clock, he goes into this. I don't know what happens in his brain, but he's quite chilled in the daytime. And then when it gets to six o'clock, he just begins to, to ramp up. Like half so, hour. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, let's see. He'll be back at some point, no doubt. I'm so glad. Hi, Ali Price. He's just joined. We love Ali Price. Now, look, Hi, we're going to talk about something quite, well, we're going to start with something quite specific, which I know will go off on many tangents because that's how we chat. But yeah. the crux of today's chat, which I think is important for all of us, is learning to recover and reset after tough times. Now, this is obviously so relevant to all of us because at some point after this almighty shit show we're living through, we're going to have to reset and recover and and start again. But also, I was really thinking about this before I spoke to you today. You know, this is relevant to anyone who has been through a tough time. And that could have been five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Yeah. Because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and you can sort of maybe flesh this out a little bit. I think there's it's never too late to reset and recover. Even if that big chunk of time has passed, it's yeah. never too late to reset and recover. Absolutely. I mean, in, in therapy, sometimes I'll be working with people and they may have had a trauma 20 years ago. And, you know, I start working with them and you begin resetting, really. And in session one, you start that process of resetting and getting them back on track again. So absolutely. And I also believe as well is that because we're still in the middle of all of this kind of COVID stuff, rather than wait until it's over to reset, my argument is that we should all be kind of resetting regularly anyway, because the problem is when we don't stop to reset, it accumulates. And I think what I'm seeing with a lot of people at the moment is they're just kind of waiting for it to be finished before yes. they start ready up. Whereas I think actually the reality is there's probably a, you know, there's a way to go yet. I think, you know, there's good news, which is brilliant, but I think there's a way to go. And I think, well, why not reset as you go along so that when we do eventually get to the end of it, you've processed and dealt with a lot of stuff. So when I talk about this today, I'm going to do it using the trauma model because yeah. I think inadvertently, a lot of people have felt traumatized. Um, not necessarily in the PTSD way, which it might be for some people, but there are two types of trauma. You know, I talk about capital T trauma and small T traumas. And I think unquestionably, everyone over the past year has had a lot of small T trauma and you can process and you can deal with that and move forward. And I think if I'm talking about moving forward i'm going to do it in a trauma context does that make I sense think yeah it makes total sense and, and, I, and i think it's a really good starting point to identify you know if you're watching this tonight and and you would like to you know try and start the process or at least you know think about the process of recovering and resetting it's good to at first distinguish right is this a big t from my past a, a big old trauma that you know even if, and I've had this personally myself, you try and not look at it or you suppress it, push it away, it's rumbling along under there and it, and it causes, you know, it manifests in so many different ways. It could be depression, panic attacks, OCD, whatever, you know, it comes out in, in many different forms. Or, you know, do you want to look at today, you know, what you're talking about as well, Owen, this collective it could be small T trauma, it could be big if you've lost somebody or your whole business has completely, you know, been destroyed, whatever it might be. Um, how we can start to reset now, because it's such a good point. I hadn't really thought of that. I 
possibly I'm also going, oh, when this is over, I'm going to look back at this and process it and work out where my heads are. But you're saying we can, we can start to reset now. How, how do we even go about that? What's the first sort of foot on the ladder to, to do that? A good question. I mean, I think you can only start where you are at this moment. And I think a lot of people, I'm seeing this a lot with people I work with, and I'm seeing a lot of people at the minute completely burnt out, exhausted, overwhelmed. And I think if that's where you're at at the minute, then that's probably a really good place to begin resetting because then what you've got to do is deal with whatever's gone on over the past year. And of course, let's be honest about it. It's not just the past year. You bring, you know, you bring your own life to, to big life events. And if we think of the last year as a trauma, you also bring all of your own patterns to that. So I think that a good starting point is if you are struggling tonight, today, it's about the acknowledgement that you're struggling. And I think for, for most people, the moment, I know I've said this to you before, but the moment you admit that you're struggling, the moment you say those words to someone, I'm having a tough time, I'm struggling, I'm not quite sure what to do. I think automatically, it almost drops off a few notches because you've just kind of, you've literally opened the door, haven't you? Because you've said, okay, right, I'm struggling to do this on my own. So I think the first thing is that acknowledgement. If you are struggling, just admit it to one person. It doesn't need to be a professional. Sometimes it does, and that's fine. But even if it's your best mate or someone that you trust implicitly that's going to listen to you, that first, okay, I'm having a tough time, don't quite know what I'm doing, there's your beginning point. And I think from that then you can build and you can then move forward. You know, so acknowledge It's so me. true, but I think so many people at the moment <clears throat> feel, um, I don't know whether they feel like they shouldn't be struggling and they should be sort of stoically trooping on and doing their bit or, or you know, we, we all do that thing where we go, well, why am I moaning? There's other people way worse off than me or having a tougher time than me. And, and it's not necessarily helpful to do that. I mean, Sometimes you can get a little bit more perspective or you can step back from it all. But often if we're just adding sort of shame or embarrassment or, or self-loathing to the picture because we're going, why am I struggling? You know, my neighbour, friend, whatever, is having a way tougher time or has a much more difficult circumstance. But we don't want to devalue that pain necessarily. We just need to acknowledge it. And like you're saying, maybe one of the first steps is to talk to somebody that you love or trust to say, hands up, I'm having a tough time. And one of the lovely things I've certainly experienced um, just in everyday life is whenever you do that and you say to someone, look, like for me, I've always got little weird cognitive things going on. I'll get in a little bad loop about thought or something and I'll get a little bit obsessed with it. And rather than go, oh, this is so annoying. Like, what is wrong with my head? Why can everyone else kind of crack on and not have these? Like, you know, mine is always sort of something to do with sleep. You know, oh, something's changed. Now I won't be able to sleep. And I get really irritated by that. But if I just say to someone, look, someone I trust, someone I know will have good advice or wisdom, this is going on. You know, it's instantly normalized and often met with, oh, I've had that too. Or, oh, I know loads of different people that have come to me with a similar problem let's talk about it. And as soon as you normalize it and you don't think of yourself as this kind of, you know, freak who's got this weird, you know, thing going on, thought pattern or whatever it is, that just takes the heat off so massively. Well, what you're talking about there is you're talking about how you re-script it. Do you remember last time we talked about often we, we tell ourselves a story about who we are and what our story yeah. is. And sometimes that can be a really rehearsed story. It may not be true, but we can tell ourselves a version of our own life and I think we can often do that as well when tough things happen in life we can have a really biased narrative about how we're dealing with it so it could be I'm not coping you know I feel that I'm not good enough everyone else is doing better than I'm doing there can be a number of thoughts that go on and what then happens is you're already dealing with a difficult situation and then on top of it you then start to criticize it judge it tell yourself that you should be doing better even start to shame yourself and I think you know Without doubt, 100%, every client I work with at some level will come in and they will have that critical narrative playing out at some level. And then, of course, on top of it, they have an inner voice. It's quite critical and judgmental as well. And, you know, that, that kind of, you know, it's a cliched saying, but we would never, ever speak to other people the way we talk to yourself. No. Never. But when we're trying to work through a tough time, often all of these demons come out thinking they're protecting us. Because you've got to remember all of these patterns are very often anxiety mechanisms and they think they're helping you out. 
you know, protecting you, guarding you. But of course they don't, they get in the way. And I think one of the things is you've got to recognize what patterns have jumped out at the moment to get in the way. And the more you can be familiar with your own demons and your own patterns, then the more control you have. I think it's tough, you know, acknowledging, you know, for anybody that goes into therapy or talks about their life, it's really hard to admit, you know, yeah. these parts of you. Most of us don't like these parts of us, but once you do, then that's a road to freedom for, for moving forward. And like, you know, as, as we've said there, talking to somebody that you love or trust, and like you said, it, it, it needn't be more than one person. That's a really good starting point, but it's, it's not always enough. And we're not looking to be necessarily fixed here because I think that can be quite detrimental thinking. We're like working towards yeah. being fixed, being complete. Look, we're human. We're going to struggle on off for the rest of our lives and have joy oh, for the rest of our lives. All sporadically, this is just life. You know, we're not going to be this complete person at some point that just breezes through life. But, Doesn't happen. You know, they're, they're, no, but there is, you know, other stuff we can perhaps do after we've, we've you know, shared something that feels deeply painful or deeply personal if that if that sort of sharing element of the process doesn't feel like it's enough what would be another step or another tool we could use to help start the reset start the recovery i think it depends on the context and it depends on who you are but i mean you know if you're not a natural talker some people it may be get it down in a journal you know scribble it down paint you know record the story to yourself there, there are a number of ways of doing it but of course if you are really struggling then picking up a phone and getting an appointment with a therapist or getting help you know the nhs we've got i up they're brilliant you know you've got therapy services up and down the country you know you can pick up the phone and if you need to work work it through with a professional then do that because he, here's the thing and this is where i feel really strongly about this any degree of trauma in your life, no matter what it is, whether it's small T trauma or large T trauma, if it's not dealt with and it's not processed, it stays in the wrong part of the brain. And essentially, it stays on the right-hand side of the brain. And what you want to do with any trauma or experience or memory is you want to move it from the right-hand side of the brain across to the left-hand side of the brain. Oh, is that right? Yeah, because the minute you do that, when, when a trauma memory isn't where it needs to be, so for example, the right-hand side of the brain is where all of the anxiety threat systems are. So you've got your amygdala on the right hand side and it's like, a, it's like an alarm system protecting you from threat and it works. Sometimes it works way, way too hard. And oh use... mate, my amygdala is like yeah. on one constantly. Yeah, on... Ah! Yeah. Like, my amygdala is absolutely on one. Well, when even when they scan people, when, when you do the MRI scans on people who have had some degree of trauma or traumatic experience, what you see in an MRI scan is that the amygdala is lit up almost like a golf ball. Wow. And it, and it doesn't need to be. It needs to almost to be the size of a marble <clears throat> on the scan. So it's really, really a highly exaggerated response. And the problem is when you're not dealing with the stuff in your life, and particularly if it's been traumatic, big stuff like the past year, then what happens is the memory lurks around on the wrong part of the brain. And of course, because it's on the wrong side of the brain, it's activating all of those anxiety type responses. So for people who are feeling a bit overwhelmed, on edge, not sleeping properly, worrying all of the time, it's potentially because they've got an overactivated threat system. And if they haven't dealt with these, these incidents or these moments over the past year or bigger events in their life, then it all lurks around and keeps that system activated all the time. So in therapy, if I'm working with somebody, my goal all of the time is to try and move the memory from the right hand side over to the left hand side and when you do that then you put the memory into a, a part of the brain called the hippocampus which is like a library so you're not pushing it away you're not getting rid of it what you're doing is you're putting the memory into a library and you're saying okay that was tough that happened it was difficult but it doesn't ruin my life and of course then the moment you put it away then you free up that area around the right hand side of the brain and of course all of those mechanisms then begin to dampen down and what are we saying? You know, I know that you're you're trained in 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 lots of different methods and and ways of doing this. Are we talking sort of EMDR? Like, you know, how do we move that from this side to that side? Well, here's the interesting thing: for somebody who is really struggling and they're not functioning well in everyday life, EMDR talking therapies they can work brilliantly. But even you know, it sounds really really simple to say to someone, look, just start talking about what's going on. Even that simple act of talking through what you're feeling, what you're experiencing, what you're thinking, that in itself can be enough 
to start moving material across. So I think of it, a really easy way of describing it is like, the more you don't deal with stuff in your life, it's like a backlog. So this is why I'm talking about resetting regularly. The more you don't deal with stuff, it will backlog and it will clog up. And eventually it will feel like it's overwhelming that there's too much. So this mechanism of even just admitting to somebody, talking to somebody, just getting it off your chest, that can be enough to start clearing some of the backlog so that you can allow some of the experiences to move across. Whereas wow. often what you'll see in trauma is you'll see people who have held it down for most of their life. I don't talk about it. I don't want people to know. I keep it a secret. I push it away. And then, of course, after a while, it just explodes and it becomes too much to manage. So this is why I think most people unquestionably over the last year, if we screen people for trauma, I know unquestionably we will get people scoring clinical. Yeah. May not be through the roof, but a lot of people I think will score clinical. So I think, you know, struggle at the moment is a very normal thing, you know, to be feeling on top of the world at the minute, to be feeling that you're on fire, you're functioning, you're, you know, your life's going in the right direction. It's a bloody big ask at the moment because we are juggling and we're navigating a lot. And I think, what I'm saying to people that I'm working with or anyone I'm dealing with at the moment is that, uh, look, over the last year, if you've survived and you've got through and you've managed to cope most days, regardless of what that looks like, you've probably done very well. Yeah. And a lot of people are telling themselves, oh, well, I, I should have built my business more. I should have written a book. I should have learned to cook. I should have. There, you know, I think there, there is no right or wrong to how we should have dealt with the last year. But I think, you know, something if you're here and you've survived and you've got through, you've done pretty well. Yeah, I, I totally agree that there is so much pressure. And I think, you know, if I look at even when I'm talking to a lot of my friends who have got, also got kids, you know, that I was chatting to some friends today and and the sort of conversation goes, oh, I feel like I'm failing as a parent. I'm not doing yeah. my best. Or I snapped at my kid the other day. And it's just, we have to keep coming back to whether this is talking in the context of family life, work, relationship dynamics, whatever. We're living through a global pandemic and yeah. we're, this is, none of this is normal. And we are trying to adapt. Like we're literally just on our toes, constantly trying to adapt and adapt again and get used to these new rules. And also there's so much fear out there. So we are, you know, I think for anybody that has dealt with any tough time, this might be triggering a lot of stuff to come up. I've certainly found that with my, you know, sleep things and the anxiety that I have that, oh my goodness, you know, I've felt quite, I, my anxiety all lives here. I think I've said this before, I can feel yeah, it. It's yeah, a very yeah. physical, yeah. visceral experience. And it's almost like alive, like tingling sometimes because and I don't even know why. It's just, you know, there's so much noise and there's a lot of divisiveness at the moment. And it's hard not to by osmosis, take some of that on because it's just everywhere. So I guess we also have to not feel bad if our choices mean, and I, I'm saying this again from, I'm obviously not a professional, I'm saying this from my own personal experience. I think we shouldn't feel bad about keeping things quite small at the moment. So yes, do talk, but if there, if we can't cope with social media, if we can't cope with watching the news every day, if we can't cope with reading about what's happening every day, the changing rules and regulations, that's okay. Because this is, there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of negative noise. And if we don't feel we can take that on, keep things really small. Like I did an interview really recently for a podcast that's coming out in the next series of Happy Place, which will be hopefully in the next few weeks. And I won't say who it is, but they're a very, very wise person. And they said when they were really trying to cultivate a fresh start, kind of what we're talking about resetting things recovering but also really trying to lay down some ground for a real positive experience and future they decided to not answer the phone at all they yeah. rarely looked at emails or text messages because if you want to really cultivate that state you've got to be so careful as to what and who you let in yeah. and i think in this day and age we're so free about it like you can have a whatsapp message you know ping up right now you can go onto YouTube and anything could be there. You know, you can go on social media and again, anything could be there. We're just yeah. letting it all in. And I yeah. think it's no bad thing at this time to go, I'm gonna put some big old boundaries up. And yeah. that might not make everybody feel happy or I might be judged, but this is for me to really get through this in one piece and Absolutely. to also 
look for some joy if we can as well amongst it all. It's almost like that, you know that old saying, right? When, when something's broken, if you've got an electric, electronic gadget and it's broken, often if you disconnect it or take it out for a while and then plug it back in, it'll, it'll, it'll kind of kick start back again. And I think our brains are a bit like that because obviously they do become exactly what you've just described, though, they become overloaded. And there are times when we have to recognize when they've become overloaded. So for, so for example, for me, if I'm overloaded, I know that I don't sleep as well. I know that small things that normally don't bother me really then start to bother me. I notice that I'm less tolerant. I notice that I don't concentrate as much and I notice my motivation will drop. So I'm really clued in to my triggers and I'll know when I'm overloaded. And I think we all have to be familiar and know when we become overloaded and when we need to kind of disconnect and start that kind of reset process. And because we've talked about this a lot, but you've always, always got to think about your brain in isolation. You know, it's an organ there on the top of your head and sometimes it will, it will exhaust, it will burn out, it will become depleted and it won't function in the way you need it to. Now, the last year, because of the sheer volume of uncertainty, pressure, nobody really knows what's going to happen next. I think most people's brains are probably a bit depleted and not functioning the way you want them to. But here's the problem. I think most of us are trying to continue as normal. Yeah. And, you know, like if, if this were a war, you know, if we had airplanes flying over dropping bombs, it would be a completely different context. And I think there's something about a pandemic because it's invisible and it's less tangible that I think a lot of people are just trying to continue as if it's not happening or, you know, yeah. we can, you know, we can't, go, but we, we can't because, you know, all of these things like lockdowns, not seeing people, not being able to connect in the same way, not being able to go to work, you know, this is only the beginning, you know, you, you know, when you think about the broader impact, of course it's going to have an impact. And I think it's worth thinking about the impact it's having on you personally. And, you know, look, we, we can't stop a lot of what's going on at the moment, but, you know, this kind of internal work where you can stop and recognise, OK, what's going on in my world? How am I responding? How am I managing my mind every day? Am I taking any time out to recharge, to reset and to kind of challenge the kind of the demons that might be coming up, the, you know, the critic, the judgment, the shame, any of that old stuff that might be knocking around in your life. It's our job and our responsibility to keep an eye on what's going on in the mind. And I think the moment you can do that, almost like becoming the, the observer, you know, you, you watch carefully and think, oh, God, this is going on today. So you yeah. almost become, cu become curious about your life, you know, and not see it as a bad thing. You know, it's I a little signpost, isn't it? It's like, okay, so at the moment, I know like this side of my neck, the right side of my neck is literally like a rock and it hurts most mornings. And then that makes my hip hurt a little bit. So I know like physically I'm like tense in certain areas. Yeah, yeah. And then also, you know, my sleep's gone a bit to shit at the moment again. It's kind of a bit up and down. But I had a really rough night last night, just sort of feeling low level anxiety. Didn't go into panic, thank God, because that is something that happens to me on off unfortunately that I, I will snowball into panic from that state at night but it's been more sort of low level anxiety and you know usually I think my um, way of dealing with that or processing it is to go oh god what is wrong with me like I said to my husband today why didn't I sleep again last night what are all these weird anxiety patterns rather than go this is a little signpost to say hmm maybe you're trying to do too many things maybe you're putting too much pressure on yourself maybe yeah. You're using your phone too much, trying to keep up and chasing your tail too much. Maybe you need time out. And for me, I'm always honest, but I'll be totally honest. That's the like, scariest thought ever that yeah. I have to stop for a minute because I'm yeah. so scared that everything will just fall apart. You know, like yeah. everything will just literally crumble if I take my foot off the gas for a minute. And I yeah. think, you know, a lot of people out there feel the same. They've just got to like keep in the hamster wheel and keep going. And, and it is hard to do so, but like you say we can't carry on as normal right now there are some things that we've got no choice with whether it's you know looking after family or some sort of responsibilities or work stuff but there are choices we can make like what we're watching reading how much we're on our phones and, and I think they seem like tiny insignificant things but accumulatively they have a, a huge impact on how we physically and mentally are just going on with our day but the small things are enormous and even that the way you were describing anxiety, you know, and the, and the worry that it's going to move into panic. I mean, that's a really common thing. People get that anxious feeling and it's uncomfortable and then they worry it's going to escalate and get out of control. And I think 
that you know that relationship and I know I, I talk about this a lot in every talk or interview I do I talk about the importance of your relationship with anxiety because every book you pick up on anxiety and every talk you go to people often talk about the tools the techniques and what you need to be doing and you need to breathe this way and you should be doing this and you should be doing that we don't talk enough about our, our, our relationship with our anxiety. That is probably for me, one of the most important things. And the moment you cultivate a kind of healthier relationship with your anxiety and you learn to accommodate it more, because, you know, even as you were, you know, I was listening to you describing your anxiety there and you can almost feel that. And I think it's the same for most people. You can almost yeah. feel the fear and the trepidation of the anxiety, like, like it's an enemy or something bad, whereas actually, you're spot on when you say actually it's only a signpost it's come up because it's trying to get you to to reevaluate to bring your attention somewhere else to stop for a bit to readjust your thinking so it's a really helpful thing so interesting and i think the more you can do that and the more you can kind of you know you know one of the things i do with with probably every client i get them to give their anxiety a name so that it's not them, you know, so you're, you know. I haven't done that. Me. I need to think of a name. I'll take your suggestions now, everybody. Do you leave just, it in the comments and I shall name my anxiety today. Just give your, you know, give it a name. So it's, you segregate it from you. It's part of your experience, but it, it's not you. It doesn't define who you are. And the next thing your anxiety comes up, then you begin this kind of dialogue with it, you know, and it was like, I don't know, if my anxiety were called Jimmy, um, when Jimmy, comes up, I'd be having a talk with Jimmy and saying, Ray, I know why you've come, Jimmy. I know why you're here. You think you're helping me. You think you're protecting me, but you don't need to. Thanks for rocking up anyway. And it's literally that tone that you're trying to cultivate with your anxiety. So rather than run away from it and see it as an, an enemy. And then it's kind of almost like um, you're almost trying to develop a playful banter with it. So that yeah. it up again, rather than it feeling like this awful yuck feeling in your tummy, it becomes, all right, this has come up again. Here's Jimmy back or whatever you decide to call your anxiety. Well, I've and just seen a couple of names I like. Belinda is, uh, Emily <laughs> has suggested Belinda. And I like Belinda. Belinda, Belinda just goes. seems completely random. So I'm going to name my anxiety Belinda. And I, and I love what you're saying. Because again, it echoes a conversation uh, that I've had recently, which will feature in an upcoming episode of the podcast. So I won't give away too much. But, but it's so interesting when we look at any big emotion and certainly the ones that we label a negative emotion that rather than you know we are so quick to try and suppress it get rid of it you know um, banish it forever and also <clears throat> some parts of oh, it's tricky territory but some parts of that sort of wellness world there will be a sort of commodification of ways that you can do that and you can be fixed or whatever but I love the fact that this is inner work and rather than trying to squash these experiences, these feelings, these negative emotions, we need to look to cultivate a relationship with them. And yeah. I wonder if, because I'm thinking back to this conversation I had very, very recently, I wonder if you'd go as far to say that part of looking at that relationship means that in some moments you might want to fully embrace it rather than push it away. So do the absolute opposite. Is that? So, you know, absolutely. I did an article the other day and um, I was asked to do it for a magazine and they asked me to talk about toxic positivity because they had heard about a lot of people during the pandemic feeling like they had been told that they had to be resilient, they had to be strong, they had to be positive, they had to repeat a mantra every day. And I actually agreed with the statement because I do believe I'm not a massive, this is going to sound really odd coming from a psychotherapist, but I'm not a huge fan of positive thinking just for the sake of positive thinking. Because when people are going through a really tough time in their life, it is near impossible. If I, yeah. I bought into you in Richmond, Fern, and you were going through a tough time, and I then started to give you a load of platitudes and cliched, oh, just you know, keep the chin up, you'll be fine, think positive, you've got this. If you're in the middle of something hideously difficult in your yeah. life, it's going to be impossible to cultivate that. And I think what we should be working more on is adaptive thinking, because adaptive thinking means that you'll recognize that something difficult is going on in your life. You won't try to deny it. You won't try to push it away. You'll accept it exactly as it is in that moment. But then what you do is you can then, when you've dealt with it, then you've kind of acknowledged it. You can then stand back and think, okay, this does feel uncomfortable. 
how can I navigate my way through this? What can I do that make things a bit easier? What will help me cope better? What will help me feel a bit more hopeful moving forward? And that's kind of how I've been dealing with the last year. You know, you, know, you can't positive way through, you know, you can't positively think your way through your pandemic and death and suffering and loss. But I think what you can do is you can constructively think your way through it and think, okay, this is challenging, this is difficult. I might need to make an adjustment at the moment. I'm struggling with this. I'm going to stop for a bit. I'm going to reset. Okay, what have I learned from that? Then I move on to the next stage. And I suppose really this conversation today is about the importance of kind of regularly stopping to do that. Stop, check in what's going on with you. Reset. What have you learned? Then you're kind of on a different platform. Then you move forward. Um, and I think that's a much more helpful way of living. And I think it's a much more helpful way of coping. Because it, do you know what I found? And you, you know this from my work in the past. I spent years working with people who were terminally ill. And I suppose really this is where my aversion to positive thinking can I, came in. Because you, you couldn't say to people who were really struggling or poorly or they were dying in the family were struggling. You know, you just couldn't go in with the positive thinking stuff. But I really did learn a lot about adaptive thinking and how that can help people and how it can enrich their lives and move them forward. Because I remember someone said to me before, um, they had a really um, awful cancer diagnosis and they were saying everyone around them was telling them that they needed to beat it, they needed to be stronger, you know, they could do it. And they said they felt really ashamed when they got to the point when it was clear they weren't going to beat it because everyone telling them that they had to succeed and they had to beat the cancer when that didn't happen they felt like they'd failed everyone God. it's part of the danger of you know almost shaming people in to be happy i mean it's ironic you know we both wrote you know written books on happiness and and i talk about happiness a lot but i talk about how we get in the way of our own happiness yeah I talk about the sugar-coated notion of you can be happy I think often we have to work on this internal stuff and I don't think we should be shaming people into thinking, oh, you need to be happier, you need to be stronger. Actually, no. You just need to be you. But actually, there may be ways in which it becomes a bit easier going forward. Yeah. For me, that's uh, important. I think that's such incredible advice. And I mean, lots of things have just sprung to mind there. Uh, one of them is um, perhaps, and, and this is not an easy thing to do by any means, if... I had done it, I probably wouldn't have nighttime panic attacks still now. But when we're going through something very tough or we're feeling depression, anxiety, and something that feels like a bit of a roadblock, yeah. the way to um, not squash it, get rid of it, whatever, but to perhaps move through it, move with it is to embrace it so so the acknowledgement and to not add shame or try and sugarcoat it or whatever but to go you know it's not me but it's happening right now and I'm going to move with this rather than push it away squash it am I right in thinking that might help speed up or or give us a little more ease when moving through tougher times it's a brilliant point you know what I think it does I think it's you know the way you describe it there is brilliant in a way because what you're talking about is how you accommodate you know and sometimes when we're accommodating something in our life what we have to do is we have to almost pull back and create much broader space around it and i think when you create that broader space you literally allow yourself time to breathe so that you can make sense of what's happening and i think that is a big part of the thing coming back to the beginning when we were talking about resetting and trauma and stuff most people don't give themselves any time to to stop and work out yeah. what's going on for them or allowing themselves time to stop and process what's going on. You know, this kind of mechanical, just keep going, keep functioning, keep, you know, keep thinking positive. Actually, no, some of the time you might need to stop and accommodate the difficulties that are going on in your life. You know, anybody tonight who's feeling a bit anxious or a bit panicky or a bit low, well, then maybe instead of just trying to fix it all the time, maybe what you do is you go towards it and say, okay, right, let's let's create a bit of speed. Let's let's let me accommodate this. Let's sit with this for a bit. And almost like, you know, when your best mate, I don't know, like, you know when your best mate's having a really tough time and they ring you up and, and in normal times they say, Will you come around or should we just sit and have a bottle of wine and talk about life in the world and stuff? And you do that and you go along and you see them and you have a chat with them and you sit down and suddenly everything just starts to feel better because you've stopped. You've created a bit of time, you've created a bit of openness, you've 
you're listening to what's going on for them. And I think it's a, it can be the most therapeutic, cathartic thing in the world. But I think when we learn to do that with ourselves, really, when we learn to stop and think, okay, right, you're struggling today. You know, I can see you're worried or I can see you're a bit flat. I mean, it's literally having that dialogue with yourself. I think when we learn, yeah. suddenly then things become much easier because that part of you that's struggling then doesn't feel like it's on its own. Yeah, well, like, if you look at, like, say we, say we talk about, you know, grief here, you know, there are some cultures that have, you know, real ceremony and ritual with quite out and out physical grieving to yeah. uh, honour it and to embrace it. And, and I feel like, you know, in the modern Western world, we just try and internalise everything. And it's really... It's really not great. One really important question that I, I think I need to ask, it's, it keeps popping into my head, is for anybody watching this now who really feels like, you know, say they've been through something very, very tough, but they feel like they absolutely will not and cannot recover from that situation, what then? See, I don't believe that to be true because I think most people can recover. I think with the right, the right help, the right support, that doesn't mean that it's not difficult. I think often people, people can fall into traps where they start to feel hopeless or they can feel powerless. And yeah. I wholeheartedly believe that most things can be resolved. It doesn't mean that it's perfect and it doesn't mean that they won't struggle from time to time. But I think in human life, most human pain we can deal with and we can resolve and we can get to a point of ease, but it's just about patience, really. And I think what I see a lot is most people spend a lot of time and energy doing the things that don't help them, you know, because often the short term fixes are the things that don't help us. You know, they are the things that just kind of paper over it quickly and push it away. But unfortunately, longer term, it keeps the problems going. And I would say to anybody who is feeling that they're not fixable, I don't think any of us need to be fixed anyway. But I do believe that most people's lives, and I talk about this every single day in my work, I believe most people's lives can be happier and better than they are because we, we all create our own obstructions. We all buy into the, the thoughts. We all buy into the false narratives. And we all, this is probably the most important thing, we all give ourselves a really tough time. You know, yeah. and this is the key thing. Human beings give themselves a really tough time. And I suppose as a therapist, I have the privilege of, hearing people's stories and of course you get beneath the skin of people and you're you're hearing the stories and when you you know I meet some of the loveliest people on the planet who are just like the rest of us struggling from time to time and when you hear how they talk about themselves and how they judge themselves you just think oh my god you don't need to do that no you're we all do it we all yeah. do it and it's so so problematic it's such and it's and it's really exasperated by the fact that you know we think we're watching what everybody else is doing the whole time, usually on here, you know, like, oh, everyone else looks like they're dealing with it or whatever or coping. And, and then you put more pressure on yourself and you talk so badly to yourself. And none of us need to be doing that. We just no. don't. We need to just so desperately get rid of that horrible acerbic voice that we you know, put upon ourselves. It's and that, so and dangerous. That's and that's the conversations that need to be happening more because we talk a lot about resilience. We talk a lot about positive thinking. We talk a lot about this kind of, yeah, you need to strengthen up. Look, the, there are some value in some of these ways of thinking, but unless you change that relationship with how you treat yourself, how you speak to yourself, how you respond to your life, then the same patterns will play out over and over and over again. And I think for me anyway, in my work, that's probably one of the most important things. I'm less interested in techniques and all of that stuff until that internal voice starts to change. Because I think once you begin to work in that, then you've got something really, really strong to work with because you can almost become your own ally instead of your own enemy. Yeah. So then, then when things are difficult, you've kind of got something to fall back on. So if You know what? I think something else that plays into that internal voice that we have is when we've been through something tough not always but when we've been through something tough sometimes we don't believe we deserve to recover or mm. heal or reset we don't 
we might not be able to see a way out of it because we don't deserve it. As I said, that's not always the case, but sometimes that is the thing that's actually blocking us, that we, we feel stuck in it because we think, well, how could I ever feel okay after, you know, a terrible thing happened? But again, we all need to know that we absolutely deserve to, but that's, to reset but that's not, and recover. But that's not the voice of the person. I think that's a voice of shame. And again, you, I think yeah. you have to segregate that because shame will tell you, you know, you know, I think I'm a, I can be an expert in shame. I've talked a lot about, you know, coming out Catholic, gay in Ireland and all that sort of stuff. You know, shame will tell you, you know, there's a difference between guilt and shame, but shame will often tell you and make, help you to believe that you're not enough or that you're not lovable or you're worthless. And that's a really, really strong voice. But, but you know, people are not born full of shame. They inherit shame. You know, and that's given yeah. by life experiences, families, people, churches, all of that stuff. But that doesn't define who you are. And again, it's a, a bit like what we were talking about earlier in terms of accommodation and resetting. It's similar. If somebody feels they're not deserving of recovering and getting better, well, then I would say, look at your shame. Because that's the voice of shame telling you that you shouldn't recover. And that doesn't mean that it's true. It just means that it's an old, unhelpful voice. And your job, a bit like what we were talking about earlier with anxiety, one of the most powerful ways of dealing with shame is to face it head on. You know, and really, really bravely and courageously face up to shame because the moment you do that, then you take the charge. And of mm -hmm. course, the, 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 the automatic, you know, all of us have an automatic mechanism. We feel shame. We do the opposite, don't we? We repress, we hold down. We, yeah. it, we deny all of that stuff. We cover up. You know, I did that for years in my late teens and my early 20s. I mean, I was absolutely filled with shame because I believed my sexuality made me a bad person. Yeah. I believed that wholeheartedly because, you know, the church and upbringing and all of that stuff, the equation was, you know, if you don't fit into normal parameters, well, then this is sinful that you go to hell. Now, as a teenage boy, you can't make, you can't make sense of any of that stuff. No. And this is not just about sexuality. It can be being told in a family that you're not good enough or yeah. people are told they're ugly or they're too big or they're too small or they're too skinny or you're never going to be as good as your brother. All of this stuff shames people. And I think, you know, it's a recognition, any of those voices in your mind that are telling you that you're not enough, that you're worthless, that you're not deserving. That's not your voice. That is the voice of shame. And yeah. seeing that is a really important thing. It's, it's such a great thing, again, to um, recognise that as something separate, much like anxiety or depression or, or anything else that isn't fully us. Um, it's so good to sort of name it. You know, I can certainly relate to that to a lesser degree than your own experience. But, you know, in this weird job that I've done since I was a child, I've had such loud noise, you know, outside judgment or people just telling me who or what they think I am. And I've had to definitely make friends with that one and go, this is not the truth, first of all. Um, this can apply to anyone, you know, with friendship circles, people at work, colleagues judging you, thinking things about you. A, yeah. it's not true. Yeah. B, it's so much more about the other person than it is <laughs> you. But if, um, you, if you take what you've done with your life, though, I mean, and it kind of brings me to, to kind of where we were going with all of this here. All of that stuff that's happened in your life, you've been able to use it to do your work and, yeah. and work well-being and supporting people. So that's kind of, even though it's been challenging, it's difficult, you've used it to reclaim life. Yeah. In a different yeah. way and help people. And I suppose likewise, when I talk about shame, you know, I made a decision that I wasn't going to be defined by it. And of course, it informs how I work and how I act as a therapist, how I write my books, whatever I do. So, you know, without that shame, I don't think I would be able to authentically do my work the way I do it. I think it makes me yeah. a better therapist, if I'm being honest. Of now, course it does. Yeah, of course, because you, you feel it. Like, you know, I love what I do today because of that. Like, I will channel every inch of, like, pain I have felt or I'm feeling yeah. or shame or yeah. whatever it might be into something. Because if I, And I, this is why I do think it isn't a flippant thing to write down how you're feeling. It's really powerful because if I'm talking on here if i'm writing in a book if i'm talking to a mate about all this stuff i feel like i am switching i'm using it for something it has a purpose and also yeah. you can cultivate empathy compassion all of these things from 
from that sort of shared experience, which is which is so so important. Um, God, there's so many more things I want to ask you, but I am very mindful <laughs> that I need to go and put my children to bed. And um, we, we, we always promise we're going to finish up on time. We, ne we, we never, never do. We never do, do we? Okay. And if we had no boundaries whatsoever of time, <laughs> we would be here until the early hours, still probably sort of slightly slumped on a desk chatting. We should, so many we things should I do wanna, wanna you're not you. there some night, shouldn't we? Some night you're not Yeah, late, a talkathon. I, I was up at three o'clock in the morning last night with the dog. The dog was crying and I was stood out in the back, in the back garden. It was freezing. It was three o'clock in the morning. It was raining. And I, I just stood there. You know, you just think, Bloody I was hell. probably awake then as well, to be honest. <laughs> if I wake up at three this morning, I'll go on live and we'll have a chat. Go online and we'll do, a, we'll, we'll do an all-nighter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, once again, look, we'll definitely follow all this up because there's there's so many other tangents we go off on and, and, and so many um, things that we really need to talk about, um, especially on a Sunday night, because it seems a time when people really need a bit of a hug. And um, that's what I hope all these conversations are, that people feel they can take something from it or just feel a little bit of comfort in knowing that you're not alone in any of what you're feeling you're really not everyone is struggling on varying degrees at the moment and um you know a great thing like Owen said today is you know talk do talk talk to someone if you can a mate or if you're really really having a rough time you know there's there's lots of brilliant charities doing great stuff and many different phone numbers Samaritan's Mind charity that, that you can call and um all easily searchable so if you're really yeah. really having a tough time it, it's it's very important to bear that in mind as well yeah and kind of summarize what we, we were saying at the beginning i mean just even a couple of small things about the importance of stopping to reset it's just hugely important you know don't let it accumulate keep an eye on how you're speaking to yourself keep an eye on those kind of critical voices that jump out you do not need to give yourself a hard time yeah. and, and finally there is no right or wrong way of managing this and getting through all of this here you know sometimes doing what you're doing might be enough. Sometimes doing less or doing more of something might help you out a bit. But, you know, maybe some of what we've talked about tonight might give a couple of ideas. And I think often we're all stopping to re review and evaluate, you know, how we cope, how we function, how we manage better. And maybe sometimes just like, you are know, really keeping an eye on that, you know, above everything, just go easy on yourself. Because I think even yeah. if you get that right, that one thing can make, an enormous difference to, to your life in general. Go easy on yourself. Like I need that one daily. I'm sure all of you do. Go easy on yourself. Just don't give yourself a hard time on top of the already global hard time. Well, yeah. certainly in this country, you know, it's, it's rough. So don't, don't give yourself a hard time. And also before I do eventually wrap up, you know, <laughs> bear in mind, that in the context of okay just so we're all really in this together you know we all have tough times we all experience pain we all fuck up we all make mistakes yeah. every one of us yeah. there's there's no there's no exception to that rule even the people that you think look well shiny and wicked on tv they make so many mistakes everybody makes mistakes go easy on yourself i'm saying this for me i'm saying this for you like we're all in this together and it's it's a shared experience like we don't have to feel isolated and alone this is a shared it's we're all going through stuff and we've all been through stuff if we're not going through stuff now so it's a shared experience but like owen said let's leave it on this note go easy on yourself i'm certainly going to take that way with me today owen you are a legend Thank i you. love talking to you Thank so you. much Thanks for having me. It's been great. Oh, it's been so good to talk again. We'll do another one of these soon. Um, and I hope I get to see Will the dog at some yeah, point yeah. again. Because I'm in be love. A, it's going to be a monster the next time you see him. <laughs> It'll be like a, a great day running down the high street. That little pouch you saw me <laughs> carrying him and I don't think he fits into it anymore. <laughs> His little papoose. I know, he doesn't really fit into it properly. We're going to have to get him a bigger one. <laughs> That's a game of buggy. Oh, I know, exactly, exactly. A dog buggy. Well, look, Owen, thank you so much. And if you've watched this tonight and you think someone could benefit, please do pass it on to them for them to watch at a later date as well. Big love to you all. Owen, you're the best. See you all soon. Thank you.